Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, in this video, I'm going to go over the semi Taraj defense, an opening that makes me very mad. And I'm sorry in advance for for being so subjective in this video, but after having studied the semi Taraj for for this video, and I had a look at a lot of games, I had a look at a lot of positions, and they sort of I believe that the semi Taraj is sort of like using cheat codes to draw on a high level because the positions you get are extremely simple compared to some other openings. So firstly, compared to a normal Tarash, the semi Tarash is probably a hundred times simpler. It doesn't invite any structural disadvantages. So even though it shares the name with the Tarash, it's semi Tarash, it's nothing like it. Black doesn't accept a weakness for dynamic play. Black has no dynamic play. And it's very very easy to steer the the game into calm waters a position where nothing is happening so for top grandmasters it may be a nice way to play a risk-free game and to try and go for a draw with black which is understandable because if you are 2800 then you win with white draw with black and that's fine you make progress if you are 18 19 17 1500 2100 then playing the semi tarash is in my opinion a bad choice because it wouldn't it won't develop your tactical skills and it won't show you uh, well it will not make you think hard enough that being said of course playing an opening which is in theory equal with correct play doesn't mean you're going to have an equal game you can mess up but i'm not a big fan of this opening because you can after i would say a week of learning make sure that you are not worse with black after move 15 and that it's very hard for white to go for an advantage sorry about the rent and about the subjective intro to the video but that's just what i what i think so okay there are a couple of ways to play this opening of course if white does nothing if he continues with something like e3 in this position, then we can easily transpose to a normal Tarash, to a symmetrical Tarash. Uh, you can uh, look at the game Bobby Fischer, Petrosian, or Petrosian Bobby Fischer in their candidates final 1971, where Bobby Fischer won with an incredible victory. He had the worst structure, but he won with the black pieces uh, from that position. But that's, that's not really the semi Tarash, so I don't want to talk about it here. Uh, the options white has uh, are basically after c takes d and knight takes d. Now, what's the difference? In the normal Tarash, since the knight is not on f6, after c takes d, black has to recapture with the pawn, thus accepting an isolated queen's pawn or a weak pawn structure or whatever. In the semi-Tarash, after c d, knight d, there are no structural weaknesses. If you look at the pawn structure, uh, if white plays e3, which is highly likely that the e-pawn is going to move, it's going to be symmetrical. And then if these two pawns get traded off, it's symmetrical here as well. So if you have a symmetrical pawn structure, that means it's hard to create imbalances, which means it's hard to go for a win with either side. And basically white's choice is branch out from this position. He can either go e4, which is the only proper semi tarash move. He can go e3. Or he can go g3. We are going to have a look at all three moves. Uh, excuse me. So e4 is the most aggressive, opening up your king's position and your bishop with tempo, and that's the main line. Let's look at g3 and d3 first. g3 is the move I'm most mad at. Uh, one thing I should note, this position resembles the Catalan very much, uh, and it could transpose into some Catalan positions but it could most often transpose into the english opening either the symmetrical english or the asian court kuraitsa english with e6 so let's follow the the main line there are a couple of moves for black here knight c6 cd and knight c3 we're going to have a look at all three uh, unfortunately for people that watch a game in this opening uh, all three are very much equal Okay, let's look at c takes d4 first. This is the simplest. c takes d4, of course, knight takes, I'm sorry, of course, knight takes d5 is played, not knight takes d4. If you go knight takes d4, 
then knight takes c3 and pawn takes c3 would create an imbalance, no need for, for white to risk that. So knight takes d5, queen takes d5, queen takes d4, and now queen to b5, which is sort of a tricky move going for imbalances, but one of the main ideas in the semi tarash is you want bishop b4 check. You want to trade off with tempo and castle quickly because, for example, in this position, the g7 pawn is hanging. So e4, queen b4 check, and after bishop to d2, a, a little tactical move, knight to c6. Of course, it's not possible to, to do much in this position. Queen takes b4 is the main move. If uh, bishop takes b4, let me actually... Oh, a cat got... Oh, the cat is a cat is on my balcony and it tried to enter my room, which is weird. I live on the second floor. Wow, it's walking. Oh, I don't know if you can see this. Look at it. It's looking inside. Can you see the cat? It's looking at me and it's walking on my window. Whoa. Okay, I'm I'm sorry for this. I don't know if you managed to see that, but there was a cat on my window. And okay, now there's a weird big bird flying around. Okay, something's going on with the wildlife in my neighborhood. Anyway, uh, so okay, if we look at this position, if bishop takes, if bishop takes, then we simply take the queen here, and the knight is, uh, the knight is loose with check. It's trying to go in again. I don't know what's wrong with this cat, but okay, so. I'm sorry for the digression, but I live in a neighborhood with a lot of grandmothers and a lot of cats. It's very calm. It's very calm. Uh, not too many young people, no sounds. So when we first moved in, Lucy and I heard one cricket and we could hear it distinctly. So it's a very calm neighborhood. And the cats just lie around and run around. Everybody feeds them and everybody likes them. But they try to enter our apartment, apparently. So, sorry. Anyway, uh, after knight to c6, a trade happens, queen takes b4, bishop takes b4, bishop to b5, and now bishop to d7. Again, if you, if you take, the knight takes, everything is defended, and if you take the knight, bishop takes bishop, we check first, and then bishop takes c6. A completely equal position, everything is about to get traded off, pawn structure is symmetrical. After g3, uh, the second move I would like to have a look at is knight takes c3, which creates some sort of imbalance after bc3 and c takes d4. But of course, white doesn't recapture with the knight. He takes c takes d4. And again, an equal position. One good thing about this one is that black has a chance to play for a 2 to 1 pawn advantage on the queen side, which shouldn't be enough for an advantage, but. But yeah, at least it's some sort of imbalance. Bishop to b4 check, bishop d2 takes, queen takes, and now b6 is more precise than castles because you want to challenge this bishop. Bishop g2, bishop b7, castles, castles, equal position. And the only imbalance, as I said, is this two to one, but it shouldn't be enough, uh, but it shouldn't be enough to win. Uh, still, I would recommend after g3 uh, the move knight takes c3 as the most active because you at least get that. So if you face g3 in the semi tarash, this is probably the way to go. The main move is knight c6, and now we are in the English opening. Uh, after bishop to g2, one of the main moves is bishop to e7. And after bishop to e7, this is now the English. I'm going to show you one game. Uh, Aronia Rajabov, just to show you a different type of move order, starts as a reti, but now we have a symmetrical English, uh, knight f6. And this position after bishop to e7, as you can see, is very, very similar to what we have here. Okay, so it's in fact the same position, Aronia and Rajabov. The only difference is that white has castle, but you can see we can reach this from an, from an English as well. So castles the same position, castles, knight takes d5, e takes d5, d takes c5, bishop takes c5, an IQP position for black, but not a big deal really, and that's why bishop to e7 I don't think is, is a good move, why would you accept uh, an isolated queen spawn if you don't have to, still that being said, it can be played. The main move is c takes d4, 
Knight takes d4, not accepting a structural disadvantage for no good reason, of course. Knight takes c3, b takes c3, and now knight takes d4, queen takes d4. Uh, taking with the b-pawn is possible, but white doesn't want to allow uh, this to happen. If you take with the b-pawn, you are slightly worse. After check, bishop here, queen takes. You have blundered the pawn, so of course after bishop takes, queen takes, this should be... This should be much better for black. Not winning, it's very hard to win this, but a pawn is a pawn. So after knight takes d4, you don't want to give up a pawn, so you take with the queen. Accepting this slight disadvantage, but after queen takes d4, you now take with the c pawn. And, well, again, we have the same position. Um, that being said, if, if black doesn't take on d4, Wanting to play against these two pawns, then still it's it's nothing major. The best move is simply to take and play against this pawn. So queen d4, c d4, bishop check, an exchange happens, king e7, and is there a way for this to be any more equal? I don't know. But this is still a theoretical position, by the way. On move 20, 10 games have been played. Yakovenko Rajabov, Frezine Rajabov, Kramnik, Lotier, um, Horvat Adam has played this. A horribly boring position. Okay, that's g3. Let's look at e3 now. e3 after cd5, knight e5 uh, basically transposes to the Karo Khan defense, uh, which may seem strange in this position, but after knight c6, uh, we have something similar to an exchange Karo Khan with bishop d3, bishop e7, castles, castles, which is the main line. We are going to have a look at that. Uh, and if after e3, c takes d4 happens, and e takes d4, we now have a variation of the pawn of Karo Khan. Bishop b4, bishop d2. I'm going to show you how that happens. Uh, this is a game between Gatakamski and Anatoly Karpov. Uh, so e4 by Gatakamski, c6, d4, d5, e takes d5, c takes d5, c4, the pawn of Karo Khan, of course, knight f6, knight c3, and now this variation with e6 by black. After knight f3, bishop b4, cd, knight d, bishop d2. You can see that this position is quite similar. It's in fact the same. This one we have reached via d4, d5, the, the semi-tarash with c5, cd, knight d, e3, and now c takes d4, e takes d4, bishop b4, bishop d2. And this one we have reached via e4, c6, d4, d5, ed. Pawn of knight of six, knight c three, e six, knight of three, bishop b four, c d c d, bishop d two, knight c six. So the same position. So e three is highly likely to transpose into a panov or an exchange Karo Khan, which is good if you are a Karo Khan player. Oh, it's not good if you're not, of course. But this position, even though it may seem very very good for. Uh, for black because of the IQ, IQP on d4, it's not that easy. I've been uh, on both sides of this position, more often uh, on the black side, but it's not easy to defend this. Uh, a few plans after you start playing against this pawn is, as black you want to blockade it, but white wants to exert pressure on h7, so you are going to have to concede to playing g6, which weakens your uh, dark squares. So bishop f6, for example, bishop e4, knight c7, you want to you want to make sure that you don't have to recapture on d5 with the pawn. Queen d3, g6, you have to do this. Bishop h6, bishop g7, you have to do this. Trading of your bishop. And now rook f2, e1. And, I mean, there isn't that much pressure. I find these positions comfortable for, for black because I've played them a million times. Uh, last game I played against my coach, Mate. Uh, he defeated me, but I blundered uh, a sacrifice on f7, which I shouldn't have. But still... I'm quite comfortable in these positions. b6 is common. We want to fianchetto your bishop. Bishop d5, knight d5, knight d5, queen d5, rook e5 is a common uh, team that happens. Queen d6, for example, rook a to e1, bishop b7. A very, very equal position. Knight versus bishop. You could argue which piece is better. You could argue whether this pawn is a weakness or a strength because d5 is going to come. Once it does, equal pawn structure. 3, 2, 3, 2. The only thing that has to happen is a trade of these two pawns. Again, very equal. But e3 is a much more challenging way for white to play because the pawn of Karo Khan is, of course, a very aggressive opening. So if you want to transpose to the pawn of Karo Khan and punish black for playing the semi-tarash, then e3. Okay, e4. 
uh, is the, I'm sorry, I've gone a bit too far. E4 is the main move in this position. So after the semi tarash with C5, CD5, Knight D5, E4. Now this force is a sort of Grunfeld trade, uh, an exchange Grunfeld, knight c3, b c3. The difference is that your bishop is not fianchettoed. And if you have knowledge in these positions in the Grunfeld, then, uh, then you are going to have an easier time playing this. Of course, going for a Grunfeld now is not common. It has never been played because this takes time. Your pawn is already on, these, on e6 and in this position probably h4 as you can see, would be enough using the time. So you need to hurry. You cannot go into a Grunfeld. But it's very similar with the bishop, of course, not being on the best possible diagonal, but but still. C takes d4 is the main move. C takes d4. And now the point, again, bishop b4 check. You want to go for a quick uh, castles, and you want to trade off that bishop. Bishop d2, bishop takes, queen takes, castles, and now bishop c4 by white. Again, a normal Grunfeld placement of the bishop, White has this very strong pawn center or very broad pawn center. Bishop on c4, knight on f3, uh, isolated pawn on a2. So white is basically playing the Grunfeld for white and black doesn't have a Grunfeld bishop, which is why he doesn't have attacking chances. In this position, the, the, the lines branch out on move 11, either knight d7, knight c6 or b6. The idea is the same. You want your bishop on b7 in all of those lines. So you are going to play b6, uh, in, in every single one of those positions, same as what we did against against g3. And let's, for example, look at b6. If you start with b6, then castles, bishop b7, rook f1, knight d7. If you start with knight c6, then castles, b6, rook a1, bishop b7. What white wants to do, white wants his rooks here, black wants his rook here, his knight either on c6 or on d7 and the bishop on the long diagonal. So the main line is knight to d7, which I think is better than knight c6. You're not running into d5, and you also are controlling c5, e5, and f6. So I believe that the main line is the best. Castles, b6, rook f1, bishop b7, rook a to d1, normal placement, rook c8. And now bishop to b3. And again, very boring position, I'm sorry to say, uh, because... Something is going to have to happen in this center. White center is broad, but it's weak. And black has the open C file to play for. If an exchange of rooks happens uh, on the on the C file, then it's going to be steering towards the draw. But after something like rook e8, h3, knight f6, queen f4, and knight h5, I don't know who's playing for a win here. I don't know who is supposed to be better. The move bishop b3 was much uh, was much was very important to stop rook to c2. And perhaps something like queen f6, knight f4 could be interesting. But still, these two pawns control too many squares. It's very hard to do something. From this position on, there have been ten or so games played. Most ended in a draw. But white won five games with the move h4, and this is the most aggressive. The most aggressive move. The reason is you want to start pushing. Well, you want to open the position up, and this bishop is better placed than than Black's bishop. And if some of these pawns move, uh, then maybe a rook could come into play. Maybe if the if the knight gets in after g4, g5, maybe the rook could come via this route or here. So, if somebody has attacking prospects, is white. If it's white, if white wants to risk, he could go for that. Let's look at uh, just one game. Uh, I wanted to, to show you this one uh, because I think it's interesting. David Navarra playing white against Wesley So. In this position, he played h4. And as we know, David Navarra is a very tricky player. a6 played by Wesley So. b5 is more common. Knight e5 coming in. And this is the best placement for an IQP position, uh, the knight on e5 because it's supported by a d4 pawn, but since the pawn is on, on e4, this makes the position all uh, the better for white. So, of course, there are threats of knight takes, which are not as powerful because this pawn is here, so the rook is not supporting the e6 square, but still a lot of threats. Knight f6 defending and threatening to take on e4, of course. So queen f4, queen to d6, g4, Navarra playing very good aggressive chess. Rook e7, and he doesn't care, g5. H takes, h takes, knight h5. 
queen to e3, g6, and now this is a very ugly defensive setup. I mean, something is going to give. I don't care what the engine says, this is hard to play. Rook to d3, uh, rook e to c7, trying to get counterplay on the c5, c5, king g2, a5. Bishop to d1, this bishop wasn't really doing much here anymore, and this is a threat. Bishop a6, and now just bishop takes h5, giving up an exchange, a perfect exchange sacrifice. You cannot take here, of course, because of g6. So bishop takes d3, bishop f3 saving the bishop. Uh, rook to d8, he doesn't even... Uh, well, yeah, okay, if queen takes bishop, then queen takes knight. So that would be possible, so rook to d8. Rook to h1, starting counterplay, but now bishop f1 check, a brilliant move, saving the bishop. Uh, king takes f1 and queen takes d4, and in this position uh, he just resigned. There's, I mean, after queen to f4, yeah, after queen to f4, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, in this position black resigned, uh, and it was just over. So yeah, uh, after rook to d8, uh, rook to h1, bishop f1 is a nice attempt, a perfect move. I mean, I really like the move, but after king takes f1, queen takes d4, queen to f4, it was game over. There is no way to defend this, even though white has, well, it's now two pieces for a rook, but this is becoming indefensible. In this position, uh, well, what would the best defense actually be? Let's say he plays a stupid move, a4. Now the threat is obvious, you want to go queen f6 and, and rook to h8 or queen to h8, mate. So there is no defense. So yeah, a very interesting game. I wanted to show it to you from this position with h4. So seemingly fighting the semi tarash with e4 leads to equal positions. But if you are willing to risk a bit, and of course Wesley Sol was playing black here, it wasn't some petzer. So knight e5, a very strong idea, and then g4, g5. So remember that as a pattern. and. If you want to fight the semi tarash, uh, play the main line with e4 and remember this h4 move and g4, g5 uh, and knight e5. So again, uh, David Navarra Wesley saw 2019 played on the 22nd of February. So look at that game once again. Okay, uh, thank you for watching. Hope you liked the video on the semi tarash. I hope you don't mind me having shared my subjective opinion about the opening. And stay tuned for more chess. Bye.